Welcome to Module 1.3, Research Methods in Cognitive Psychology. This course can be found at blogs.umbc.ca forward slash cognition. Please join us. The learning outcomes for this section of Module 1 involve the development of knowledge. We want you to be able to list and describe the types of research methods that are used in cognitive psychology. We also want you to walk away with an appreciation of the types of methodologies that we use. So to acknowledge the importance of the diverse research methods used in cognitive psychology. Here's a quick overview or roadmap of where we're going in this section. We'll first explore some descriptive research methodologies, experimental and quasi-experimental research methods, cognitive psychology experiments, and we'll then uh, begin to explore cognitive neuroscience. Cognitive psychologists use a variety of research methodologies. One of the first categories that we'll explore here is the grouping of research methodologies called descriptive research, naturalistic observation, case studies, and self-report. Naturalistic observation is the observation of behavior in its natural setting. One of the concerns of this type of research is that thinking itself is not observable. Therefore, we have to infer what's going on, the cognitive processes, for, through the behaviors of people. Case studies involve an in-depth examination of a small number of cases. Cases could be as few as one or less than ten. The issue here is generalizability. You also have to um, recognize when generalizability is not an issue. So for example, some of the principles of memory that are still relevant today were developed by Ebbinghaus. He used a case study of one himself. Those principles, such as forgetting curves, etc., still hold today. Self-report. Individuals report on their own knowledge, attitudes, feelings, and opinions. Here you can guess the issue that arises from this type of research is that it's purely descriptive. Here are three references to articles in the literature that use descriptive research methods. So, uh, for an example of naturalistic observation, one study looked at the vocabulary assessment of deaf and hard of hearing children from infancy through the preschool years. Case study uh, example from Dr. Paul Sayaklik here at the University of Northern British Columbia. He, in collaboration with Dr. Laurie Buchanan at the University of Windsor, examined stimulus-specific neglect in a patient who had deep dyslexia. Another example of uh, descriptive research methods using self-report. Uh, Dr. Jamie Campbell at the University of Saskatchewan looked at adults' strategy choices for simple addition and the effects of retrieval interference. There they used a combination of verbal report and experimental methods. So I've highlighted a few of the issues associated with uh, the three types of descriptive research methods that we've introduced here. But what are the values associated with these uh, methodologies as well? Generally, the value in using descriptive research is that it provides a starting point for new lines of experimental research. So, for example, in uh, Dr. Campbell's research, he used both verbal reports and an experimental methodology. The issues generally speaking, associated with descriptive research, is that that line of research cannot address the how or why questions associated with cognitive phenomena. Over the next few days, what I'd like you to do is to take the time to observe people in your natural environment. In particular, I'm going to set up a scenario here where I want you to observe people who are talking in a group. There are three or four people, uh, and maybe they're blocking the hallway. Now, there are other people that are going to walk, want to walk through the conversation. Observe how people walk 
either through or around uh, groups of people having a conversation. What do you notice? We'll come back to this activity in the language section of this course. Okay, let's move on now to quasi-experimental research. Here I'm going to focus primarily on experimental research and we'll explain the quasi-experimental approach in a few moments. Experimental research involves a systematic manipulation of the independent variables and the observation that this manipulation has on what we call the dependent or measurement variable in a controlled setting. It allows researchers to then make a causal statement regarding the effect of an independent variable, the IV, on the dependent variable, the DV. There are differences between descriptive and experimental research. Let's explore them. Laboratory studies, or experimental research, establish control of the independent variable and extraneous variables, those variables that we're not interested in. And then we, it allows us to measure the effect of controlling that independent variable on a certain dependent variable. Don't worry, we'll give you some concrete examples of independent and dependent variables in a few moments. Ecological studies have limited control of the independent and extraneous variables, yet they still measure the same dependent variables. What are the advantages and disadvantages of experimental research? Well, some of the advantages are that they have systematic, or the researchers, we have systematic control in the experiment. We have internal validity. That is, we're measuring what we are supposed to measure. The disadvantages, as you can appreciate, are the loss of ecological validity and the potential for expectancy effects to occur. So please note, in the past two slides, I didn't highlight the distinction between quasi-experimental and experimental methodologies. That will arise in this section of the module, Cognitive Psychology Experiments. So how is it that cognitive researchers see cognition? Well, we see cognition through the manipulation, the controlled manipulation, of an independent variable on the dependent variable. The most common types of dependent variables that are explored in cognitive research involve speed and accuracy. Other types of measures include physiological measures, so electroencephalograms, PET, and fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging. We can also explore things like the number of solutions to problems, the frequency of responses. So how do cognitive researchers influence cognition? Well, it's through the types of independent variables that we use. Now, the different types of independent variables that we rely on will either be ones that we have direct control over or ones that we uh, don't have direct control over. The ones that we have control over are, in our experiments, lead us to true experiments. The ones that we don't have control over, we just classify people, for example, um, those are called quasi-experiments. So, for example, participant variables. I, as a researcher, I can't make you any younger or older. I have no control over that. So that variable makes a particular experiment quasi-experimental. Material variables, for example, in my line of research and uh, with visual word recognition, I have control over the types of stimuli I'll present to my participants. The material variables are something that an experimenter can control. Experimental context variables. So, for example, I can control in my experiments whether a participant sees a group of only regular words or a group of only exception words. A third group might see uh, both regular and exception words. Those are called list manipulations. There are also performance measure variables. This is where we use a dependent variable 
uh, to generate a participant variable. For example, some of you might be fast readers, some of you might be slow readers. We can measure that and then classify you into groups based upon how you perform in a pre-test for reading speed. One of the important things to consider in cognitive psychology experiments are whether confounds exist. Confounds or extraneous variables are variables that co-vary, that is, they go together with the independent variable. The problem with confounds is that as researchers, we do not know if the effect on the dependent variable was in fact due to the independent variable, the confound, or a combination of the confound and the independent variable. So be on the lookout for confounds in others' research and avoid making them in your own. Now let's explore cognitive neuroscience. In essence, cognitive neuroscience is a new wave of research. Here are some examples of cognitive neuroscience from here at the University of Northern British Columbia. Dr. Paul Syaklak, who I mentioned earlier, has examined brain trauma and the inability to read non-words. Dr. Ken Perkishan has used fMRI to study differences in first-person versus second-person experience of pain. Dr. Glenda Perkishan has l examined alexithymia, temporal constraints in uh, processing facial expressions. And myself, I've used fMRI as well uh, as a way to neuromodel word recognition. Cognitive researchers can use a whole range of cognitive neuroscientific tools or research methods when examining cognition. Let's look at three here. The case study. Here we might examine the relationship between a particular cognitive process and brain injury. We often compare those people that have a particular brain injury with those that don't have a brain injury. What we're looking for is whether there's a single or double dissociation uh, with respect to one or two cognitive tasks that we ask the participants to engage in. Electroencephalograms or EEGs, they're the recording of electrical potentials associated with cognition. The advantage of them is that they have great timing. The disadvantage, poor localization. Now let's contract the, contrast that with a couple of neuroimaging techniques, PET and fMRI. They're based upon the principle that active neurons need food and oxygen. Here the disadvantage is that these techniques have poor timing, but they have great localization. One of the emerging techniques that, or technologies that we're using in cognition these days is uh, MEG. Here are two pictures from research that I was involved in. Dr. Ron Borowski is about to go into the MRI machine. Standing beside him is Dr. Gordon Sardi. In the other panel, Dr. Gordon Sardi is looking at one of the many computers used to control the MRI machine. Imaging research is often based on designing studies using Donder's subtractive logic. Here I'd like to put in a cautionary note about that particular methodology. In the 1960s, Sternberg convinced most of psychology that this particular logic was flawed. Let's see why. Here's a typical Donder's reaction time or RT experiment. Let's first look at the left-hand panel. Here we've got a participant looking at a computer screen and simply reacting to whether a light is presented. So the reaction time equals the mental response to uh, the perception of the light plus the response to press a button. Now let's introduce a choice. Let's move to the second panel. Here we'll provide uh, the participant with a light that flashes on the right or on the left. So the reaction time in this case is going to equal the mental response which will be the light perception and the decision as to which button to press, either the right or left button. 
and then the response. So the time it takes for us to make a decision is about 100 milliseconds. The difference between the right-hand panel and the left-hand panel. So in this Donder's two alternative force choice decision leads to a 100 millisecond increase in reaction time. In the 1960s, Sternberg conducted a series of experiments that provided us with a little more food for thought regarding the application of Donder's subtractive logic. Let's explore Donder's subtractive logic again using some simple math. So task one, and let's align that to what you saw in the right-hand panel of the previous slide. That might involve components, cognitive components, A plus B plus C and it gives us a reaction time of RT1. Now let's look at a simpler task, the left-hand panel in what we saw two slides ago. The cognitive components involved there are only A and C. So we, when we subtract task 1 from task 2, what we're left with is a measure of the amount of time it takes us to do cognitive component B. Now, Sternberg argued that one could not be sure that the processes A and C were not simplified in task 2 or somehow different in task 2 compared to task 1. Sternberg figured that if you wanted to study process B, you had to examine process B when that process was repeated one to several times per trial. So the cautionary note here in neuroimaging research is that data such as these that are presented are based upon a control condition, usually a baseline, and an active condition, and us subtracting those two maps to get areas of activation. That involves Donder's subtractive logic. So we're at the end of another submodule. Here are some concluding remarks. Cognitive psychologists use a variety of research methods, and those methods both have advantages and disadvantages. So when we explore the results from cognitive research, we need to be cognizant of both the advantages and disadvantages of that particular methodology, and see how it stacks up with results from different methodologies. Cognitive psychologists need to explore converging lines of evidence.